over the years. This sanctuary here at the corner of 46th and Main Streets in Kansas City, Missouri welcomes you. Still, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, in order to be safe, this is a hybrid event. And as attendees here are gladly following the recommendations of the CDC and the Kansas City Health Department, including masks for everyone throughout the service if you're sitting in the sanctuary, social distancing, of course, and registration. We thank you for all of you who've registered. We really do thank you. We are also streaming this service on Facebook and on the Community Christian Church YouTube flat platform on their station. So hello to the virtual congregation that is joining in this affair today. Welcome to everyone here. Uh, for in as much as we do have a, a good crowd considering the conditions and good uh, considering how much our blood pressure was raised uh, by the football game last night, uh, we're glad that you're here. If you would and engage in a little bit of Community Christian Church welcome. Please find a neighbor. Uh, don't get too close, all right? But turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh neighbor, God loves you, God loves you. and there's nothing you can do about it. I want to reiterate how joyful the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Jewish Community Relations Bureau, American Jewish Committee, are in hosting this service again. In uh, light of the pandemic and in light of the anniversary of the insurrection uh, attempt in our nation's capital a year ago, uh, this service is needed now more than ever before. We're, we need to be reminded of what the beloved community can truly look like, to understand that bullying and brutality and belligerence and bloodthirstiness never have any place in a civil society. We need to be reminded that people of goodwill, strong faith, and deep religious commitments can and do make a difference and are essential for moving us all towards that more perfect union for which we all yearn. We do not do this service uh, without partners all the way around, and my partner uh, in this service has been and will continue to be Rick Hellman, and he will bring greetings now. Good afternoon. It is so great to be here and bring you greetings from the Board of Directors of the Jewish Community Relations Bureau, American Jewish Committee, and by extension, the larger Jewish community of Greater Kansas City. This has been a trying pandemic year for all of us, and the Jewish community has been especially troubled by the flourishing of anti-Semitism and the trivialization of the Holocaust that public health measures of all things have provoked. So it's good to be here among old friends with whom we've worked for justice together in the past. We remain committed to the Kingian fight for greater equality and greater democracy, as our dynamic young director, Gabi Geller, will tell you in greater detail later. But on this 30th annual interfaith service, let me say how proud I am to be the link to the JCRB leaders over those decades like my mother, the former Associate Executive Director, Judy Hellman, and uh, her colleagues, the late David Goldstein, and the now retired Marvin Schneller. So uh, they were all, and they were all, deeply moved by King's life and his death and his legacy. So thank you for inviting us to celebrate it with you here once again. So be well, be at peace, and be joyful. And welcome now Leslie Zucker, as well as Laura Steinel, who will provide welcoming music for us for this service. Good afternoon. We're going to sing for you this afternoon, In the Water. It's a song that describes the moment when the children of Israel fleeing Egypt reached freedom and safety after the splitting of the Red Sea. Now, it's based on a prayer called Micha Mocha, which we say at our morning and evening services, and in it we celebrate freedom. It literally is our prayer of hope, justice, redemption, 
and most of all, thanks. Now, you'll hear us sing very briefly in Hebrew, and those words in English are these. Who is like you, O God, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, working wonders? Now, if you've been to this service before, you know that we consider everyone in the room to be part of the band, right? Yeah. So please join us in the chorus of In the Water. And uh, such fine musicians always attend this service. We're pretty sure you'll know what to do. Safe in a basket, swaddled in reeds, floating towards freedom with Moses in the lead. It's in the water. 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 It's gonna carry us home. Well, water above us and water below and water wherever we roam. Water within us and water without and water to carry us home. Pitch in a tent in the heat of the day, dancing towards freedom. Miriam leads the way. It's in the water. Freedom in the water. It's in the water. Uh huh. It's in the water. It's gonna carry us home. Micha mocha ba elim Adonai Micha mocha nedaba ba kodesh Nora Tehilo Oh, 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 say Fele, it's in the water It's gonna carry us home Let's do the chorus Water above us and water below And water wherever we roam Water within us and water without And water to find our way home Standing on the Jordan with all who will go Crossing to a freedom, gotta go with the flow It's in the water Water Justice in the water In the water, uh-huh It's in the water It's gonna carry us home Yes, it's in the water, it's gonna carry us home. We're going to wipe down the mics, but thanks. It's always so much nicer when the band is 150. It just is. <laughs> It is my honor and privilege to uh, welcome, welcome, introduce my pastor, Shanna Stites, who brings greetings, and then followed by Dr. Vernon Howard and also Gabby Geller. Good afternoon. It is always our pleasure and our honor here at Community Christian Church to welcome this service into our historic Frank Lloyd Wright structure every year. I want to make a note that this year, just this last week, we celebrated 80 years of being in this particular building. Previous to this, we were at a building at Forest and Linwood, which uh, burned down on Halloween night, 1939. And one of the places that opened their house of worship to this congregation to worship in the aftermath of that was Temple B'nai Yehuda. And so we have, for many years, it has been, um, for decades really, um, this relationship of interfaith has been an important part of our congregation's identity that continues even now. We say every time we welcome anyone, including on Sunday morning into this space, that we are a place that practices the inclusive, radical love 
of God. And that people of all ages, all abilities, and all identities can be known and celebrated in this space as welcome and a beloved child of God. We recently did an update to our website. And on the homepage, it says something that, that I think is particularly um, important as we celebrate and honor uh, this day. We say this love is radical. It can change our world if we all work together and live this love out in every moment. This love unites us regardless of borders, affiliations, and religion. With compassion and grace, this love connects us all. This love is real. It isn't something we dream about for our future, but something we strive to live here and now. It's real because it's complicated and it's messy and we don't always get it right. But this love will always be worth the effort because even if we fail, we grow. This love opens us to hope. And that's a part of what I think this service does each and every year. We all show up, we're all a little messy, we're all doing our best, and we're trying to live out a practical love and reality into the world each and every time. So thank you for being a part of the mission and ministry of this congregation that we celebrate each and every time we gather. Welcome to our space. Greetings to everyone. Let's put our hands together and celebrate that we are back here in person again. My name is Vernon Howard, greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, proud to serve as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference of Greater Kansas City, and proud to be in partnership with the Jewish Community Relations Bureau and AJC, and once again, now for 30 years, putting on this interfaith service. We ought to celebrate that today. For many of those years, uh, Dr. Bob Gill and Judy Hellman and now Rick Hellman and others who represent the alignment across religious traditions, the alignments across race, the alignments across socioeconomic status, even the alignments across political orientation to commit oneself to righteousness and justice is the key. Dr. Bob and Rick, thank you for your work in co-chairing this year and doing all that you do. And also to Gabby Gabriella for her leadership who has brought a great fire and a renewed energy into an already strong and inspired Jewish Community Relations Bureau here. Gabby, thank you for your leadership. We appreciate it. Of course, Pastor Shana and the Community Christian family, we are grateful to you to be here once again. It is just not the same if we are not here. Community Christian, thank you so much. The last time we were together, even virtually, I did not have a wife, but now I do. I am so happy. The Reverend Shania Chandler Howard is here with us, who played such an integral role, sweetheart Stan, in the technology and the event coordination of the entire event, pulling this together. Thank you so much. We can not thank those on whose shoulders we stand enough. I think about David Goldstein and Reverend Mac Charles Jones and Samuel Ernest Mann and Judy Hellman and so many and Fuzzy Thompson and Wallace Hartsfield and the list goes on and on who had been integral to this work we thank those who came before us. We stand on their shoulders. And one, and I'll leave you with this, who is our keynote speaker today. 
who in 1972 was inspired by God to move forward with a vision called Resurrection City to advocate, to defend, and to ensure that this country took seriously the issues of poverty and economic justice for the least of God's children in this country. And for a full week at Mill Creek Park, just off the Country Club Plaza, hundreds of Kansas City residents camped out at Mill Creek Park saying to America, if we're going to be the richest country in the world, then we need to be the most merciful, the most righteous, and the most just in the world. It is fitting to have the keynote speaker today to be our founding and visionary leader way back in 1972 of SCLC and U.S. Congressman Manuel Cleaver. I know he's going to be introduced before the speech, but Congressman, we need to say thank you. It is fitting to have you here today. We'll close with this. The Apostle Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 16, greet and receive Priscilla and Aquila. They have put their necks out on the line for the church. There is no greater honor than to put oneself at risk for the cross of the kingdom of God for peace and justice and righteousness. I beseech you, put yourselves at risk and be not worried about what will happen to us, but concentrate on the fact that we are called into this work by a mighty God, and we focus on what will happen for us. God bless you, and God keep you. May you enjoy this celebration. lucky one that gets to follow Dr. Howard. <laughs> I mean, who can follow that? <laughs> um, but thank you so much, Dr. Howard, Reverend Hill, Rick Hellman, Reverend Chandler Howard, Community Christian, and everyone who works to put together this wonderful event. JCRB AJC is honored once again to be partnering with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference as we have for so many years and with our friends and neighbors of all faiths. Last year, when we weren't able to gather, I spoke the names of George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery, just a few of the names that sparked a movement in this country, a reckoning. And a year later, we stand here able to appreciate the accountability brought by that movement. The people who murdered George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery were convicted. How many times can we say that? Not enough. And surely it's still not enough it's not justice, when justice would be the changing of a system so that these things didn't happen in the first place, but it is something. And here in Kansas City, there has been some accountability too. A guilty verdict in the shooting of Cameron Lamb, the release of Kevin Strickland. Yeah. And again, these things should never have happened in the first place. But as Dr. King would say, out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. Stones of hope indeed, and ones that should be celebrated. And let us remember that these stones of hope were are hard earned, hard earned in many cases by the leaders of SCLC and others here in Kansas City who fought and fought to make sure that black lives were not forgotten. So I do wanna take a moment to celebrate the incredible leaders that we have here in our Kansas City community who are fighting the fight each and every day. We are honored to know you, and we are honored to stand beside you. You know, I really love that our city celebrations are, of Dr. King are rooted in faith, because I think that that sometimes does get forgotten, that Dr. King was a reverend, that faith in God was the core of his being and his actions, and that of his partners. 
the beautiful legacy of solidarity between the black and the Jewish communities that Dr. King fostered. That was born of an understanding of what it was like to be a persecuted minority, but it was also born of faith. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, a close friend and partner of Dr. King, reflected after Selma. For many of us, the march from Selma to Montgomery was about protest and prayer. Even without words, our march was worship. I felt my legs were praying. I think there must be nothing more powerful than that type of prayer, the type that moves us from passive to active, that insists that we not only ask God for justice, but that we move to create it for him. My prayer for this year, then, is that we all deepen our relationship with God through action, that we remember that every day is an opportunity to pray with our legs, and that when our actions are rooted in love of God, they are rooted in love of one another. And as we've seen this year, there is really nothing more powerful than that. Some of you have seen on the screen a, a slide that says 50th anniversary. That's for the founding that Dr. Howard just referenced, uh, for the founding of SDLC. And the founding of the interface service was different. And that was in 1992. All along, we've had litanies that lifted up the words that inspired, that quickened the impulse for justice and freedom. And we're going to do that now again with some representative samples from previous services that happened at St. James United Methodist Church, at Village Presbyterian Church, at Beth Shalom Congregation, uh, as well as at St. Paul's School of Theology, and for many, many years consecutively here at Community Christian Church. So I'm now going to ask Rick Hellman, Dr. Howard, Gabby Geller, uh, Reverend Chandler, as well as Rabbi Alpert to join me and be prepared to quickly come to the microphone in an expeditious way for these, uh, this litany that we will engage now. We have come to this hallowed time to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to encourage, to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. We, re we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we have come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. When the Montgomery bus boycott began, little did we know that we were starting a movement that would rise to international proportions, a movement whose lofty echoes would ring in the ears of people of every nation, a movement that would stagger and astound the imagination of the oppressor while leaving a glittering star of hope etched in the midnight skies of the oppressed. The greatness of a community is most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members. A heart of grace and a soul generated by love. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. If American women would increase their voting turnout by 10%, I think we would see an end to all of the budget cuts in programs benefiting women and children. Coretta Scott King. True greatness comes not by favoritism, but by fitness. If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that the one who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's a new definition of greatness. It means that everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Every 
moment is an organizing opportunity. Every person, a potential activist, every minute, a chance to change the world. The great social justice changes in our country have happened when people come together, organized, they took direct action. If people don't vote, everything stays the same. You can protest until the sky turns yellow or the moon turns blue, and it's not going to change anything if you don't vote. In too many places, racism still rears its ugly head. We come to this sanctuary in time to affirm that racism is Satanism, unmitigated evil. In a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. To speak about God and remain silent on the evils of the world is blasphemous. The hour calls for high moral grandeur and spiritual audacity. I'm here to talk about uh, our honorees and the woman for whom the honor is named, Evelyn Wasserstrom. She was the late, uh, she is the late former director of the Kansas City branch of the National Conference of Christians and Jews. And uh, the honor given in her name is given for the commitment, or for commitment, I should say, to causes of freedom and justice for minorities and oppressed people in the greater Kansas City metropolis. I knew Mrs. Wasserstrom personally just a little bit as she was the mother of my friend Bruce Wasserstrom. Uh, but I came to know more about her when I was the editor of the Kansas City Jewish Chronicle. She chaired uh, the Kansas City Mayor's Human Rights Commission. She also served as the international president of B'nai B'rith Women. Among her many leadership positions were serving as president of the Jewish Community Center of Greater Kansas City. Uh, and the Parent Teacher Organization of Greater Kansas City and the Foundation for Retarded Citizens. And uh, she joined with my mom as a member of the Panel of American Women, which spoke all over town uh, advocating for racial understanding in the 1960s. Uh, Mrs. Wasserstrom organized the first Martin Luther King interfaith service in the Kansas City area, and the award was created in her honor uh, by our chapter of SCLC after she died in 1988. It's our great privilege and our honor and our joy to announce and present uh, the 2022 Evelyn Wasserstrom uh, Award and present it to the three recipients that we've chosen this year, Rabbi Doug Alpert of Congregation Kol Ami, Anita Russell of NAACP of Kansas City, and Patricia Jones Macklin of the A. Philip Randolph Institute of AFL-CIO. And uh, you'll hear just a little bit more about each one now from Reverend Bob. If you want to know where justice is to be found in this city, locate wherever the location of Doug Alpert is. Doug Alpert is the spiritual leader of the congregation Kola Me in Kansas, it's Kansas City's non-affiliated, urban, progressive synagogue that cares for each other, for the community, and the world. His resume is thick and significant. He is on the Missouri Coordinating Committee for the Poor People's Campaign. He is the immediate past president of the Missouri Healthcare for All, an ally with Stand Up for KC, the fight for low wage workers, uh, the faith co chair for Missouri Job for Justice, and a board member and vice president of Missouri Faith Voices. He's on the executive committee of the NAACP Missouri branch. He's a member and past co chair of uh, the Criminal Justice Task Force of Moore Squared, the Metropolitan Organization for Racial and Economic Equity. He's also a board member of Planned Parenthood of the Great Plains, a member of the Gamaliel National Leaders Caucus, let me take a breath, and a member of the National Clergy Advisory Board of Faith in Action. In March of 2017, he was a featured speaker at the Kansas City Women's March and has been the Jewish representative speaker for many years at the annual Gay Pride Interfaith Service. Currently, he is a rabbinic fellow 
uh, in the Clergy Leadership Incubator and National Program for Synagogue Transformation. He's the past president of the Rabbinical Association of Greater Kansas City, and he is a friend of countless ones of us in this sanctuary. It is a delight, it is a joy that we present the Evelyn Wasserstrom Award to Doug Alpert. Please come forward. Thank you for that uh, way too generous and exhausting introduction. It makes me tired to hear it. Um, I would say, it's, uh, start with an aside, that um, the only greater reward I can think of in this particular moment would be passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. But that said, I am truly overwhelmed to be receiving this award. Overwhelmed because I'm old enough to be familiar with the extraordinary work of Evelyn Wasserstrom, Zipranado Vrata, Blessed Memory. Overwhelmed because of the incredible work of past award recipients. Overwhelmed to be receiving this award along with Pat Jones Macklin and Anita Russell. To me, you are both heroes, you're my heroes. Your work leads us all toward a better world, a world of racial justice and equity, a world of justice and equity for workers, who have built and continue to build our country. On this day, I'm grateful. Grateful for the ongoing work of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Dr. Vernon Howard, who continue to lead the now over 400-year-old fight against racism. Grateful for the work of Jewish Community Relations Bureau, American Jewish Committee, for their sponsorship of this important annual event. My pride in the work of JCRB goes back to high school, with the leadership of Judy Hellman and David Goldstein of Blessed Memory. Rick, um, I think we've been friends since we were 14, and I can't tell you how wonderful it is to see that you are carrying on as a leader representing the Jewish community and carrying forward your mom's legacy. JCRB is in being an exemplar of our most important Jewish values and still the sense of Jewish pride in me. I learned in my youth from the work of JCRB that of greater importance than what we do for ourselves, we are measured by what we do for others. I'm grateful on this day for the many years of leadership and selfless public service of our keynote speaker, Congress, Congressman Emanuel Cleaver. Also, I want to give a thank you to Community Christian Church and Reverend Shanna Stites, not only for hosting this Martin Luther King interface service, but for your leadership in fighting, just, fighting for justice. And also, I would be remiss, as the uh, many years ago, the former executive director of the Kansas City Jazz Commission, if I didn't give a shout out and a thanks to Tim Whitmer and Millie Edwards as well. A special note of gratitude to Reverend Bob Hill. Bob, it is you who first got me into this work, I would say about a minute after I got into the rabbit, recruiting me to be a part of More Square. More square a gift that continues to give much to me. Bob, it's a gift to study sacred text with you and to follow your leadership. And I gotta say, introducing you to the best rubelock in the world in Jerusalem was one of the smartest things I've ever done. I do not stand here or anywhere for just where justice is being pursued without my congregants at Kol Ami. And we were wonderfully represented today, as we have for many years now, by our music director, Laura Steinel. Uh, I am most, most grateful to be um, uh, in partnership with my wife, Faye. Uh, not, that she, she, not just that she supports me, which she does, but for her own incredible work and all she does for community. It stands on its own, uh, and I'm so proud of her. But more than anything else, I'm honored to be involved in this work of fighting racism and marginalization. I'm honored to be welcomed to walk the journey with all those impacted by racism, honored to walk on the journey with fast food and other low-wage workers, honored for the many courageous faith leaders that I can call friends. And while I can't say that I deserve this award, you can bet I will be spending the rest of my life trying to earn it. Thank you.
Patricia A. Jones Mackin is the past president of the Greater Kansas City Chapter of the A. Philip Rand Randolph Institute. And uh, she will remind you of that if you ever forget it. She has registered voters for countless organizations and empowering countless citizens for the A. Philip Randolph Institute, the Kansas City, Missouri Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, and the Kansas City branch of the NAACP. She has served on the election protection, as a election protection coordinator for Kansas City for 15 years. Her purpose in life is service, she has said, and she has lived out that purpose in all that she has done. As a special education teacher in KCPS, as a staff person for the Kansas City Federation of Teachers, as a staff person for the Missouri State AFL-CIO, first African American to be employed in that capacity, as a national rep for the American Federation of Teachers in DC, as a Golden Life member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, and as a Diamond Life member of the NAACP and third vice president of the Kansas City, Missouri branch of the NAACP. She has served as president of Kansas City Federation of Teachers Retirees chapter, they wouldn't let her stop working, and also as labor community liaison for the Greater Kansas City Labor Council and Workers' Rights Board, Job for Justice, and as a volunteer with Thelma's Kitchen, Harvester's Community Distribution, and also the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition. Would you please greet and welcome Patricia A. Jones Macklin as the Washington Award recipient this year. And I was a good one to move them. 
So I thank those organizations for coming forward. My aide, Philip Randolph family. I was a president too long, y'all. It was 20 some years. I finally gave it up. But it was my African American labor leaders, and that's what A. Philip Randolph is made up of, the organization, who came through, did whatever I asked them to do, went out in the community as we we're supposed to do, and registered people to vote and helped me all the way. So I appreciate my A. Philip Randolph family. I don't know if Mike Bell is here or not. He was going to try to make it, but uh, I'm so glad he's president. And I'm not. <laughs> I also could not thank enough the Greater Kansas City AFL-CIO. Uh, we started off kind of rocking because I thought they should jump right in and help this community. They did. Duke, Elise, Reggie was not here when I told them we need to be in this community and do what we need to do because we are blessed. We are fortunate. We make our living off of people in Kansas City, Missouri. They heard me. There has not been a time that I have not asked them to help feed people, to donate to something that they did not come through and do it. So I have many little tentacles out here, but I tell you what, with all of them, I bring them in as my family and the people who enabled me to get this award today. Now, as far as my family, I gotta say something. I have a great family. Would my family members stand? Because they came out today. I love my family members. <laughs> love them. The Purnells, the Purnells, the Browns back there, the Taylors, the Clemens. Thank you. I love y'all. And I call on y'all to do stuff too, and you know it. <laughs> so thank you all for being here today. I love you all too. And finally, I want to say, uh, he's not here today. That was, that's my mate, John Macklin, who passed away two years ago. However, I praise God for John because I had a person for over 20 something years that didn't mind my fight. <laughs> and I would be out there. If I went to pick it, if John could, he went to pick it. If we were handing food out to people on Christmas, John was there. He was good. He was there for me always. I do miss him. And he always told me, you have a servant's heart. Don't forget that. And I won't forget it. Now, I'll leave on a humorous note. There was one time John wasn't with me. I was out protesting for Stand Up KC. And I knew I was going to jail. So I told John, <laughs> I said, I'm going to go to jail. I said, I know it. So he stopped and he had prayer. And that's one thing he prayed for me in every venture I went out on. So he prayed for me. I said, you coming with me? He said, nah, I don't think I'm coming with you. So lo and behold, I did get arrested. Was in jail till about 5 o'clock in the morning. And I was reminding the people in jail. They were panicking. They were upset. And I told them, I said, hey, y'all, do you think Martin Luther King sat here in jail and cried? I said, y'all ain't got nothing to worry about because we're going to be out of here. We're going to be out of this jail. So I was the troublemaker in the jail that night. So when I got out, I thought, well, you know, I don't have any phone calls from John on my phone. So when I got home, I said, John, I said, I didn't see where you called me. I said, you're sleeping pretty good. He said, you know what? He said, I gave it to God, and I knew he would make it all right, and he did. Thank you. Uh, uh, Joseph Mackin, I can't see out there. Are you here? I don't see you, but he sent me a text, so I would have to lift up the Macklins also. Thank you.
Anita L. Russell is with us, even though she is not in this room. She's watching virtually. She's uh, currently serving as the second vice president of the National Association of the Advance for the Advancement of Colored People at NAACP, Kansas City, Missouri Branch. Having recently completed 16 years as the branch president. During her tenure, yeah, you can give her a round of applause for that, yes. During her tenure, the membership of the branch more than doubled to over 1,200 as the branch uh, brought younger people into the organization while also blending the expertise of long-term civil rights advocates. In 2010, she spearheaded the task of hosting the NAACP National Convention here that brought in almost $8 million to the Kansas City area. Recently, she completed 12 years on the National Board of Directors for NAACP, representing the 10th State uh, Region 4. She is a subscribing Diamond Life member of the NAACP. But her volunteerism and community involvement doesn't stop there. She served two terms on the community-based uh, anti-drug tax combat commission and a six-year term on the 16th Judicial Circuit Commission of Jackson County. She's currently on the Jackson County Freedom Wall Commission, the Kansas City Women's Suffrage Commission, and is co-captain for uh, Kansas City in the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition with Patricia a. Jones Mackey. She is an official deputy register for the Kansas City Election Board and conducts voter registration for the NAACP, her church, and the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Beta Omega Chapter, of which she is an active life member. She's a member, and she wanted to make sure that we gave a shout out to this, and you know why. She's a member of Ebenezer AME Church and serves on the church's board of stewards, the lay organization, and the Women's Missionary Society, the Commission on uh, Christian Social Action, and the Commission on Membership and Evangelism. Put your hands together for Anita L. Russell. She has communicated to me her words of acceptance, her service, didn't, doesn't ever stop. She is caretaking, she's a caretaker for a person with some underlying conditions uh, whose doctor said that it was not advisable for her to be in any contact with any person. So she, out of protection for that person she's giving care to, uh, sent these remarks in her stead. Good afternoon, she says. I am honored to have been selected as one of the recipients for this year's Evelyn Watchstrom Award with Rabbi Doug Alpert and my good friend Patricia Jones Mackin. Thanks to the committee that selected me for this prestigious award. I'm sorry I cannot be there to accept my award. I'm a caregiver. And due to the increase in the Omicron variant, I've been advised against ex exposure to large gatherings. A special thank you to SCLC and JCRB AJC for hosting this interfaith service, which begins our Martin Luther King celebration, and for the work of your organizations that, that you do throughout the year for freedom, justice, and equality. We must stay vigilant in protecting our rights always uh, seem to be under attack. It is difficult to believe that we are still fighting for voting rights in 2022. Civil rights organizations such as SCLC and NAACP and others must stay on guard. Voting rights are more important than anything else. It is our voice. If we lose our right to voice, vote, we will have nothing. Please call your senators and ask them to pass the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. I'm going to repeat that. Please call your senators and ask them to pass the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. The vote is all we have to make our voices heard. Without it, there is nothing else. I humbly accept this award. Thank you. Anita, we will be sure that the award gets to you. The choir will now come forward in advance of their presentation of music. And as they take their place, Rick will give us an invitation to generosity. 
have to admit, I'm not quite sure why they turned to the Jewish non-preacher to make the appeal for funding this year. Perhaps a change of pace is in order. But I'm a writer, so I wrote down a few thoughts on how it is I can have the chutzpah to appeal for your contributions on behalf of SCLC. I mean, perhaps you'd like to honor us for 50 years of faithfulness to the mission that was set forth by our founder, Martin Luther King Jr., and taken up locally by the then young preacher, then city councilman, then mayor, now Congressman Emanuel Cleaver II. Perhaps you want to support our most recent work, like helping to convince the city, if belatedly, to honor King with a street named after him, or the pressure campaign that we've helped to lead to force out Chief Rick Smith, a man with a troubling record of countenancing police brutality up to and including manslaughter, or perhaps you were impressed by our 2020 March on Kansas City, which drew well over 1,000 people into the streets to commemorate the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington and to peacefully participate in that summer's George Floyd movement. Or maybe you appreciate the way that we've kept Kansas City's own George Floyd figures, black men like Ryan Stokes, Donnie Sanders, Cameron Lamb, and others in the news and supported their grieving families in their quest for justice. Perhaps they invited the Jewish guy to make the appeal so I could talk very briefly about the etymology of the word that we translate from Hebrew to English as charity, and that's tzedakah. It has the root in the Hebrew word tzedek, which is justice, and so for us, charity is justice, it is love, and it is peace. As the great Rabbi Hillel said, the more charity, the more peace. So in that spirit, we humbly ask for your support. We'd be passing the plate, but in these digital and COVID times, we have to ask you to hit the PayPal link. Uh, that should be on your screen now, and I see it in the screen above me, so you can hold your phone right up to the computer and uh, make a little donation to SCLC. We'd really appreciate it. Those of you here in the room, there's a clear uh, uh, box at the top of the stairs so that you can uh, drop a check or some folding money, no coins please, on your way out. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Mia Ramsey. I have been gifted and afforded the opportunity to become the new executive director of the Kansas City Boys Choir and the Kansas City Girls Choir. I would be remiss to not mention the awesome founder, uh, former Wasserstrom Award winner, uh, our friend Ali Robinson, who gifted me the opportunity. So, as we sing, for uh, this offertory period. I would just like for you all to keep us in prayer. COVID is very hard to navigate with students. And so I'm grateful for these that have come out today. Continue to pray as God has increased our opportunities as well as our territory. So thank you again. Thank you to this organization who has always been uh, uh, close to my heart. And so at this time, I present to you a portion of the Kansas City Boys Choir and the Kansas City Girls Choir.
that we'd like for you all to help us. I heard you helping us. Listen, the choir was established earlier, so we're all part of the choir now. On this last song, we're only going to do one verse of that song, but it speaks to the time. This was written years ago by one of our favorite uh, artists, Donnie Hathaway. And so we'd just like for you to join in with us. You'll know when.
One more time for the Kent City Girls Choir, Kent City Boys Choir. Thank you for the prayer of that Donnie Hathaway song. Before I begin with the, our brief prayer, I wouldn't feel right if I didn't acknowledge the gratitude that the Muslim community has for the friendship that we've had over the years from our fellow brothers and sisters from the Christian and the Jewish community. People who were members of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and also the, the local Jewish community and also Congressman Cleaver who I've heard at times insisted that there be Muslim representation at these kind of events. Also, Reverend Bob Hill, you may not remember this, I think it must have been after 911, the first call that I received from anyone to see if we were safe in our mosque came from Reverend Bob Hill. So let us assume a posture of reverence. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim with God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. O oh, guardian, evolver, keeper, cherisher, and sustainer of the heavens and the earth, and all that exists in between. Too big are you to be contained in the universe yet you dwell in the heart of every believer. We ask that you continue to grant that our hope be active with movement, that our backs never bend and our determination never ceases to be defiant against whatever comes to stand against the advances towards the intended destiny for humanity. That the best come as it was destined from the beginning by your divine will and plan from the beginning, amen. It is my high honor and a humbling task to introduce the one Kansas Cityan who almost needs no introduction. So famous is his name, so profound is his impact upon the landscape and everyday life of Greater Kansas City, so generous is his engagement with everyone he meets. I have been exceedingly pleased to call Emmanuel Cleaver friend for more than uh, three decades. We have been in each other's pulpits, we have shared countless meals, we have enjoyed a mutual affirmation of the holy task of proclaiming the word. In all those years, I have found Emmanuel to be a devoted husband, father, and grandfather, a compassionate and caring pastor, a powerful, prophetic, delightful, and ever-creative preacher, a leader with a constant eye toward unity within the realm of religion, a public servant with a constant heart toward solidarity within the whole fabric of the human community, a wise and savvy politician, first as a city councilman and then as mayor of Kansas City, Missouri for two terms, and then as a U.S. congressman representing the people of Missouri's 5th Congressional District. A standard bearer for the cause of societal harmony, civic achievement, and individual excellence. A friend loyal to a fault, the kind of fault-filled loyalty to which we all should aspire. He has other faults, to be sure. About his driving, I will not comment. Those who have been unwittingly enrolled as passengers in his vehicle describe it as a once-in-a-lifetime event. But for now, I simply share with you the happy privilege of calling Emmanuel friend. We will continue to ponder the magnificent growth of grace in him as we all remain fervently thankful 
that Emmanuel Cleaver's life has blessed our lives and our shared journeys in faith. So the next voice you will hear after the extraordinary music of Millie Edwards and Tim Whitmer will be that of Reverend Emmanuel Cleaver, leader, preacher, friend, par excellence. chains holding me I wish I could say all the things that I should say say them loud say them clear for the whole round world to hear I wish I could share all the love in my heart remove all the bars that keep us apart I wish you could know what it means to be me then you'd see and agree that every man should be free I wish I could give all I'm longing to give. I wish I could live like I'm longing to live. I wish I could do all the things that I can do. And though I'd be way I wish I could be like a bird in the sky. How sweet it would be if I found I could fly. I'd soar to the sun and look down at the sea. Then I'd sing, cause I know I
Uh, I think I have to follow that. Um, amen. Uh, I would love to uh, hear both of these great musicians. Uh, Tim Britton and Billy Edwards. I, I'm not going to do this anymore ever again. I asked if I could sing with them, and she was very kind, as she has been in the past, to say, come on, uh, call my bluff. And uh, of course, uh, Nina Simone is one of the great of all time. And thank you for, for, we've had a mixture of just about everything, which is what, a, what the, the country is, uh, a great uh, mixture. And it's good to be here. Congratulations to all of the award uh, recipients. Uh, I know all of the recipients and all of them uh, are certainly deserving of this and, and much more for what uh, they have done in this community. Uh, congratulations. And uh, I think, I was thinking, uh, who, uh, I guess it was Dr. Howard said, uh, uh, Doug Howard is at every any issue if it's related to justice and, and that is about as accurate uh, a uh, description as you can get. Um, and I told Pat Jones, she, she's heard it before, anytime she asked me to be somewhere or do something, that's what I'm uh, going to, to do. And I, I tried to, to, to do that religiously. Um, her husband, John, was uh, one of my sidekicks uh, in the ministry for about 15 years. And, uh, a great, great spirit uh, in this community. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here uh, with you now. Uh, Bob Hill and I, as he mentioned, we've been friends uh, for years and years. In fact, I've probably preached here more than I preached any other place except St. James. And uh, we go back a few decades together and uh, one of my one of, one of my great memories will, will be uh, as long as I can maintain mental dexterity is uh, the three couples Bob Hill and uh, his spouse and Wallace Hartsfield and his spouse and, and me and my spouse spent about eight days together in Turkey and had an opportunity to see that mixture of of uh, what I think the world probably doesn't understand, and that is that we are a part of a monotheistic religion. If we are uh, uh, Islamic, if we are Jewish, if we're Christian, we, we all come from that Abrahamic tradition. All of us derive our religion from the great uh, Abraham. And so uh, it's sometimes a little silly that, I've, that I have seen uh, people who want to fight over something that uh, is anti uh, everything that the monotheistic uh, religions are about. Uh, but it, it is good uh, to be here. I'm, my, one of my, my unofficial, uh, my unofficial homiletics professor uh, was a guy who has visited our church here a lot and, and who I uh, fell under as a, a, a learner early on, uh, Fred Shuttlesworth, the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. Uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth um, uh, was one of the founders of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference a uh, pastor in Birmingham, Alabama, he coined the phrase Bombingham, Alabama. His home was bombed. He happened to, thank the Lord, been in the kitchen. Uh, and they threw the bombs in the back bedroom. Uh, and he survived that and much, much, much more, more much, much more. Uh, but he uh, wanted to make sure that as a young guy, along with uh, a guy, my, a decent uh, friend, uh, John Nettles, Reverend John Nettles, he's trying to, we, they brought us on as a youth movement in the, in the SCLC. And uh, even though uh, John Nettles and I both uh, 
uh, were either in seminary or had, had already uh, completed seminary. Uh, they wanted to teach us how to preach. Uh, and Shuttleworth, uh, you know, after listening to me preach at, at, at the West Hunter Street Baptist Church in Atlanta, came up to me and he said, uh, uh, now, I don't think that we could call him. Now, Manuel, uh, you, you were a little long. Well, I'm not uh, blaming you for being long. He said, I, 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 I've done that myself. He said, what I, what I blame you for is not knowing how to fix it. So he said, from now on, here's what you do. When you start feeling like you know you've been there a little long, you say, I'm wrapping up now. And then he says, 15 minutes later, you say, I'm closing it out. And he said, they won't even recognize what you've done. So um, I, I'm not going to practice uh, much of what uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth uh, preached, but I, I, I will uh, acknowledge that he and uh, the other four founders of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, were magical in terms of, of my own life, and uh, every Christmas, I and my grandchildren are required by Diane Cleaver, the matriarch, to watch the 1983 holiday classic called The Christmas Story. Um, it was a low budget, believe it or not, film about nine-year-old Ralphie, uh, who wanted as a Christmas gift an official Red Rider Carbine Action 200 short range model rifle. I knew about it because I wanted one. Additionally, we had to watch the 1946 dramatic film called It's a Wonderful Life. Now, who here does not know that George Bailey, played by Jimmy Stewart, was contemplating suicide? God heard his prayers and commissioned a second-class angel who wanted to do a great job and earn his wings. Now George marries Mary and they have three children. Uh, you know the story. One Christmas Eve, uh, Uncle Billy unknowingly gives his company's bank deposit to the ever scheming Mr. Potter, Mr. Potter who keeps the money. And then the bank examiner comes and quickly discovers that the deposits are missing. And George, president of the bank, is faced with financial disaster. Not to mention arrest. And George gets drunk and heads to a bridge to kill himself. The angel shows up to the bridge and gives George an idea of what the world would be like had he not been born. Now the story ends when the entire town turns out and they all share their monies together, they save the bank and they save George and they live happily ever after. Every Christmas season, it seems, after having watched The Wonderful World, I slip into a spirit of introspection. And I do that in that 
I'm trying to minister to myself and, and, and analyze myself and, can, and, and criticize myself. This is a psychological state of mind. And when I'm in this place, I wonder really clearly, what if I had not been born? What, what, what if I had not come into existence? And one of the things I start out with by thinking before I attempt to examine others, one of the things that I must do, I learned this from the leaders of the SCLC, is that if we were going to change the United States, we had to start with us. In other words, we had to function at a high level of discipline. And when I wonder what if I had not come, I quickly conclude that Reverend Gardner would have been happier if I had not come into existence. Our Reverend at the Mount Lebanon Primitive Baptist Church. My, my three sisters and I and, my, and our six first cousins, we are mongrels. We, we, the, the first Disciple of Christ Church in Pine Hill, Texas is actually owned by my grandpa, Frank Cleaver. The, 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 the ground was donated and um, we ended up running from Disciple of Christ to Primitive Baptist to Plain Vanilla Baptist <laughs> to United Methodist. Um, but at this particular occasion, we were at Primitive Baptist Church, which was my maternal grandmother's church. And I have to tell you that the Sunday, the week before, uh, my three sisters and I, and I my, our, our mother, we had spent time with my Aunt Edna. Aunt Edna was the smartest woman who ever walked the face of the earth. Never had a college degree. I don't know how she uh, learned what she learned and how she became so articulate, uh, but she was. And she taught my three sisters and I all kinds of things, rhymes. Uh, this is the church, this is the steeple, open the doors and see the people. All of, you probably learned that, but we learned all kinds of, kinds of things from Aunt Edna. But uh, she also taught me something that I shared before, and that is um, there was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She hugged them tightly, gave them some broth, put them to bed. And that stayed with me. That happened on a Tuesday night, and on Sunday morning, Reverend Garden, Gardner, actually, uh, preached a sermon about helping the poor. And I thought, this is good. I'm at the right church. All these other churches I've been to, nobody's talked about giving anything to the poor. Reverend Gardner became my favorite preacher at that time. And after, his, after this sermon, my, my mother and I and my oldest sister, my sister who lives here, uh, my youngest sister hadn't been born. We, we all are following him to the door. Reverend Gardner shaking hands with those who had come to worship. And I thought, oh Lord, this is perfect. You put me in the right spot, Lord. So as we got up to the door, I said, now, Reverend Gardner, you were talking about that uh, uh, given uh, to the poor. And I, I agree with you. I, obviously, I wasn't saying it in the same way I am now. And I said, but I, uh, we need to start out with this woman that Aunt Edna told us about who lived in a shoe and then all of a sudden, I start, uh, people were pulling me out of the way, my mother, my grandmother, 
my oldest sister dro dropped her head and she was trying to walk away. Uh, these were not Christians. They were not people who, who could stand up to the truth. And, I, and so I, 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 I had all of the commitment that I could conjure uh, to the poor. And I wanted Reverend Gardner uh, to, to do something about it. He never said a word. He just looked down at me. As if he was saying, I sure wish you had not come. <laughs> My first job was working for the Barnes Maintenance Company. I was assigned to work in the, at the SAC base, Shepherd Air Force Base is in Wichita Falls, Texas, where I graduated from high school. And the SAC base, Strategic Air Command, was located there at the time. And uh, I was sent from the Barnes Maintenance Company to clean up there uh, five days a week. And I loved that job because I had gotten a security clearance. I had a bag, I had uh, some kind of thing in my pocket that said I was a good person. And so uh, I was enjoying that. I thought I was special because uh, I walked around with these airmen who back then, those days, took off for Russia. They called back. Uh, and this was a big, big deal to me. And I loved that job. It was my, the summer of my um, 10th grade completion, so I was going to the 11th grade. And everything was great. It was a great summer. Um, until this particular Saturday night that I was getting dressed to go to Billy Vash's party. I mean, you don't know Billy, but uh, it's going to Billy's party. And then uh, we had one telephone. We no longer had, uh, we no longer had, uh, you know, the uh, dial phone. We were big time. We, we had punched, uh, we were punching. Uh, and so uh, my father answered the phone and I could hear him say, he's here. Uh, I didn't know what was going on. My father hung up the phone and he walks into my room. I was the only person in the room. My three sisters had, had a room together, my mother and father and me. I had my own room together. My father comes into my room as I was getting dressed to go to Billy Vash's party. And he said, Mr. Barnes just called and the guy who was supposed to clean up the J.C. Penney store didn't show up and he wants you to go down there. Uh, in our house, work was like sacred. It was so, so I didn't, there was no arguing with my father. I just went and changed clothes and then uh, walked down to the J.C. Penney store. Um, after I had been there for about 30 minutes, the devil walked in from the, the uh, unlocked doors on, on, the, on the left side. And uh, he comes in and he begins to describe what was happening at Billy Vash's party. And, uh, no, this is, this is serious. So I, I um, stood there for a while listening to him and was convinced that it would be the right thing to do for me to go around and change the price tags on hundreds of items in, in the J.C. Penney store. I mean, after all, they had ruined my uh, weekend. So I changed price tags. And on Monday morning, when the store opened, Shoppers could buy a men's three-piece suit for five dollars a piece. Women's gold earrings for twelve dollars a pound. J.C. Penney wash and dryer. Buy one, get one free. <laughs> Women's one-size-fits-all underwear, three hundred ninety-eight dollars. Installed. So I know that Mr. J.C. Penney, wherever he might have been, would have been happier 
if I had not come. Now, one of the most significant considerations on this time of year, as we remember Martin Luther King Jr., is what if Martin Luther King Jr. had not come? What if Martin Luther King Jr. had not been born? First of all, Martin Luther King was born Michael King. His birth certificate on January 15, 1929, shows that his name was Michael King. On July 23, 1957, his birth certificate shows that someone scratched through Michael and wrote on top of it, Martin Luther King, Jr. One of the greatest achievements of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was coming together from different backgrounds and for opening up the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to, to everyone. Now, I do get a little trouble <clears throat> uh, sometimes <clears throat> when I hear individuals and even the media saying that Martin Luther King Jr. was the leader of the Civil Rights Movement. He was not. And when we say that, we are actually disparaging people like A. Philip Randolph. We are eliminating people like Dorothy Height, Whitney Young of the Urban League, and, and John Lewis of SNCC, James Farmer of the Congress of Racial Equality. Those, all, those individuals are all involved, and all of them spoke at the, at the at, at the, uh, the March on Washington. All of them, Dorothy Height, unfortunately, the only, only woman, spoke last. But Martin Luther King Jr. was obviously charismatic, graduating from high school when he was 15 years old. 15 years old. And decided that he wanted to move on out of high school. He was already a straight-A student all the way through and ended up getting into Morehouse at age 15. At age 15. And there are so many achievements that I could talk about. Well, let me just talk about one, and that is the SCLC leadership in the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Most people connect that with the march from Montgomery to Selma. It is important, if you want to know this sore story, to understand that there were three marches. There were three marches on for voting rights. First one, Martin, uh, I'm sorry, the first uh, march that took off uh, was led by uh, Hosea Williams and John Lewis. Hosea Williams uh, was a chemist turned preacher, turned uh, activist in SCLC. John Lewis was ousted when he, by the, the more radical elements of SNCC, uh, kicked him out and so he continued to work with Dr. King in SCLC. Uh, but the first two were turned back uh, when Alabama state troopers uh, blocked the road, led one led by, by uh, Dr. King, he turned it around. Now, Rabbi Herschel was with him. It is important to know why he was there. He was there because he thought, and everybody else did, that if he walked arm in arm with Martin Luther King Jr., that the uh, Alabama state troopers would not open fire. He was the security for Martin Luther King Jr. Are, are you walking with me? Right there, right there at 
that spot, we can see the inseparable, inextricable connection between the fight we put forth and the Jewish community walking with us at risk Now, when the march ended, SCLC had achieved this goal. And, it, and the goal was this, to get on every television station, get in every newspaper around the world, because they wanted the world to see what this great democracy was doing. And it was out of that embarrassment that Lyndon Johnson was able to move Congress to support the Voting Rights Act. Now, let me tell you why I don't, um, you know, I think it's important for, for everybody to, to understand a couple of things with this voting rights deal. Um, the filibuster. We don't have the filibuster in the House, it's in the Senate. And the last person to actually use the spoken uh, filibuster uh, with, with some success was Strom Thurmond on the Civil Rights Bill. He stood up and filibustered for 24 hours and 18 minutes. They stopped him because the doctors became concerned uh, about something that might happen uh, with his urinary tract. I'm just telling you what the deal here. So the filibuster had its greatest day trying to block the movement of civil rights. And so the filibuster is now the voter buster. This filibuster was not brought down from Sinai by Moses. It's only about 50 years old. It, it, it was created by some human beings sitting around in a, in, a, in a room trying to figure out what they could do to stop the stuff that they really didn't want to happen. And it's being used today to prevent the movement of legislation needed to stop what's taking place around the world, around the country. Look, there is a Leviathan lie afoot in this country, which says that Joe Biden didn't win the presidency, that actually Donald Trump did, who lost by eight million votes. And so what what they're saying now is that uh, you know we have, we have uh, to put our whole democracy. Uh, uh, to the side in order to make sure that we put people in who lost that we like. And so right now uh, we have difficulty getting the legislation through. I, say, I always keep saying I'm going to quit watching all the TV news uh, stations because I get mad uh, because they say, well, what is Joe Biden going to do? Uh, you know, in other words, if we don't get the bill, it's Joe, Joe Biden's fault. Because another man won't vote. Who was being recruited all day, every day by the other side to leave the Democratic Party and become a part of theirs. And so I, I tell people all the time, I don't call people names, why are you guys going to beat up on this man who, if he goes to the other side, will dramatically change this moment in history that to, to the point that our ancestors and Dr. King would not even recognize it today. We are in a situation right now where Georgia makes it illegal for an individual to give someone a sandwich and a bottle of cool water while standing in line to vote. This is not a lie. This is happening right now in, in Georgia, in Arizona, in Ohio all over the country. And they're passing these laws, they say, in response to all of the fraud that took place in the last election. 
Now, even Bill Barr, even Bill Barr, Lord help, even him, said there was no uh, fraud in the last election. Did he, I'm going to add this part. Uh, Biden just whipped him by 8 million votes. And so all of these laws, including flirting with them in Jefferson City. The, the, the Voting Rights Act was important because it did a number of things. One, it said you could not gerrymander to leave people of color or people uh, uh, who have uh, uh, some kind of a uniqueness uh, out of the process. The other part was that the Justice Department can go into any community and monitor elections. But the third and most important part was this. No community, no state, no congressional district could change anything from the norm without Justice Department approval. And that's the key. Preclearance is what it's called. And so if you passed a law in Florida uh, or in, in Georgia that said you can't give people water, you can't do that unless it is approved by the Justice Department. Or if you let Diane Cleaver and I, who live on Gregory Boulevard, change our voting spot so that we have to go to Marlboro and vote, actual fact, you can't do that without the Justice Department approval. So the reason everybody is saying this is crit critical is because if we don't do it, we have people who are going to put themselves in office. They're going to put themselves in office because they don't like who the people want to serve. We, in the spirit of Martin Luther King Jr., must be vocal in all of our communities and talk to everybody about voting. Look, something has happened in this country. Something has happened in this country. I, I was with uh, my, my friend, lifelong friend, uh, Kid Bond. Kid Bond, I had some people who said they weren't going to vote for me because I was uh, in his wedding. Yeah. Some Democrats who I wish would change and become Russians, uh, Soviets. But I, I was talking to him and I told him, I said, Kit, you could not win the Republican primary in Missouri these days. It has changed dramatically. Do you know that the last time the Voting Rights Act was uh, approved was 2006. You know what the Senate vote was? 98-0. Two members were sick, were not there. 98-0. What the reason I mention that I, is that I want you to see what has happened over that short period of time, the transformation of, of a party over that period of time. I was in Israel about six weeks ago, I'm on the Helsinki Commission. Uh, Bob Casey and, and his wife were there. Bob Casey is a senator, Republican senator from Pennsylvania. And we ended up becoming good friends. Uh, you know, you spend days together and, and you, get, you sit down and talk. He, he's a, he, of course, has announced that he was, he's not going to run anymore. And I'm sitting up here begging a Republican not to retire. Please, please, Bob, don't, don't do this. You know, we have to come to the conclusion in our country that this is not going to be fixed automatically. We're going to have to fix it ourselves as voters. Now remember, nobody goes to Washington uh, as a coup as of now. They get elected. And what has happened in the country is that the country is catering to the crazies. 
One man stands up in the middle of, of, of the presidential address at the State of the Union and does something that nobody else has done in history. He interrupts the president's speech and calls him a liar. And this is on a Tuesday. By the next Tuesday, he has received $4 million in contributions. Name is Joe Wilson. You can, you can check. So if you want to raise a lot of money now, say stupid stuff. I mean, that's the, I'm, I'm just telling you where it is. Say stupid stuff. And there are some people are saying on television, they're writing it out that on January 6th, some people went to the Capitol and toured the, uh, the Capitol. I was there. I was there. It was the ugliest thing I have seen in my life. Americans running around hunting down other Americans. I was there. Nobody had to tell me. I didn't have to read it in the newspaper. I could see what was going on. I heard in my office when our annunciator went off, all members of Congress, please find a safe location. Do not stand in front of the windows. I could hear what was going on. At 2 o'clock in the morning when we went over to confirm the Electoral College vote, I could see blood on the floor of the House of Representatives. I could see doors that had been pulled away from the hinges in the House of Representatives, the citadel of democracy. Of course Martin Luther King would be ashamed. Our grandparents would be ashamed. White, black, brown, Islam, Jewish, anybody who loves justice and peace is insulted by what's going on here today. We are not this kind of country. We are better than this. We belong as Americans to the greatest democracy in the history of the world, and that democracy is now hanging over a cliff, hanging on to a twig. And if we fail to act, and I'm talking about voting, I'm talking about Pat Jones, uh, look, if we don't turn, in, turn out and vote in the midterm elections, I'm trying to tell you that this country is headed toward authoritarianism. Now, this is not the ramblings of some great liberal Democrat. Adam Kensington, Kensington said it this morning on, on Meet the Press, Republican, said it this morning. He said our democracy is in trouble. And we need to understand that. And we need to also, as a, as a group of people who are of faith, begin to erase all of the divisions based on, on religion. All of that was in the Voting Rights Act, including sexual orientation. And so the Voting Rights Act, Act is just a symbol, but we have got to come together and we have to turn out and vote. I, look here, you, you know, I want you to vote for me, but if you don't, just go vote. I mean, democracy is way more important than, than me. I, I, you know, I, I think this is a, 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 t a moment in time that we ought to be able to, to, to fix and tell our children and, our, and their children about what we've done and about what they must do. Each generation must accept the responsibility to keep democracy flowing. Let me, let me conclude, I'm sorry. I'll be finished in just a minute. <laughs> Mr. 
Because the question of the day is not whether Emmanuel Cleaver came, not really, uh, whether, Martin Luther, whether Martin Luther King came or not. The world is fixed so that, you know, uh, probably there were moments in time that we needed Martin Luther King that there was nobody there. God has a habit of picking folk at a good time when the time is right in the fullness of time, the scripture says. And so, uh, but the issue is, what if you had not come? Now that's the issue today. What if you had not come? If you had not come, would things just be pretty much the way they are? Would our future be as dismal as maybe even I am painting it? What if you had not come? What if God had not allowed you to come into the world? I want you to go through that introspection. It's tough and it can be painful, but there's not a single person in here who is a zero. Everybody in here can make a difference. I'm wrapping up now. Isn't it good to hear U.S. Representative Emmanuel Cleaver II inspire us, challenge us, remind us, oh, you can do better than that. You know you can do better than that. I'm going to ask all the participants who have uh, been thus far part of the program to stand in a safe distance way up here. We're going to be singing uh, We Shall Overcome, and after that, Rabbi Doug Alpert will be uh, leading us in a benediction. But we also want to call out today some people that are present and some people who are absent. We need to remember these. We need to do self-reflection. We're glad that Louis Duguid, Alvin Brooks, and John Sharp, former Wasserstrom recipients, yeah, just spread yourself out up here on the dais. We won't link arms, okay? But we're going to be safe. And we're going to sway. We're going to keep in rhythm and we're going to sing together. But Lewis Duguid, Alvin Brooks, and John Sharp are in the house tonight and we're grateful for that. But we remember, yes, we remember and we need to say the name Taylor Fields into this space because Taylor was an integral part of SCLC. And he has passed since the last time that we gathered, and certainly even since the last time we had the virtual celebration. And so has Robert Manili, one of the giant, giant, giants in Prairie Village. We're so glad that the Dialogue Institute folks are with us tonight. They are coming in a force of 12. They came socially distant, but they came in a force, and we're grateful for that. And Mark Sharp has been here as well tonight. I saw him earlier, I believe. And if I have neglected anybody, I apologize, but we're grateful that you are here. As we sing, as we sing together, we shall overcome. Would you please stand?
Justice. 